Good evening and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm your host, Eugene Chan. Our guest tonight is Professor Lao Xiukai. He is the Emeritus Professor of Sociology at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and also the Vice President of the Chinese Association of Hong Kong and Macau Studies. Professor Lau has served our Hong Kong SAR government as the head of the Central Policy Unit. Since 2003, Professor Lau has been a member of the Chinese People Political Consultative Conference. He is a renowned speaker on social and political development in Hong Kong, with many publications in this area. We have invited Professor Lau to come and share with us his insights into the new blueprint for Hong Kong's political and social development. Welcome, Professor Lau. Hi, hello. Um, Professor, the last few years, Hong Kong people have seen a lot of changes in both the legal and political structure, much to the response to the, the anti-government riot of the last few years that has aimed to cripple the government and also has hurt our, 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 our structure of Hong Kong. And we realise that the recent investigations have also confirmed that there's, there's a lot of foreign power into play, and that's the reason why we have to enact the national security law, much like other countries, to counteract this. Also, it's re in regarding to po the political structure, we have the improved political system. That means we have the oath-taking for our, 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 our members so that they will be ensuring the patriots administering in Hong Kong. And there are changes in the election committee, the upcoming legislative council and the chief executive election. So a lot has happened. It took me so long to give you a, a background. Um, do you think it happened by coincidence or it is a well-planned reform? No, this is a well-planned reform. Uh, it was drafted by Beijing back in, 19, uh, back in 2019. Right. By the uh, fourth plenum of the 19th CCP. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that means from Beijing's point of view, Beijing has already a plan for Hong Kong's social and economic and political development. Okay. The first stage is to uh, suppress disorder and turmoil in Hong Kong. And then the second stage is to make sure that the patriots are running Hong Kong, to make sure that uh, the anti-China forces will not be allowed to enter into Hong Kong's governing structure. Mm -hmm. And then with this in place, the next stage is for the Hong Kong government with the support of Beijing to launch uh, policy and inst institutional reforms to make sure that Hong Kong's social problems uh, and, and problems in connection with economic development mm -hmm. can be fully addressed by a more powerful government uh, supported by the patriots. Mm -hmm. And then, to a certain extent, uh, led and guided by Beijing. Right. Professor, you have studied a lot of Hong Kong political development over all these years. Do you think this is the right di direction for Hong Kong? Is it in the best interest for Hong Kong people? I would say that uh, it is quite inevitable that Beijing will take these steps to um, reshape Hong Kong's politics and economics. Because, as we can see, without Beijing's support or Beijing's participation, it is almost impossible for the Hong Kong government to initiate all these fundamental changes to restructure Hong Kong's economy, to restructure Hong Kong's politics, and to restructure Hong Kong society. So, um, from, from Beijing point of view and from my own point of view, mm -hmm. if Beijing does not take part in Hong Kong development, I would say that uh, the one country, two systems, as envisaged by Beijing, cannot be implemented successfully. Right. And that will be the end of Hong Kong's uh, future. Right. Professor, since you mentioned one country, two system, actually some, many people in Hong Kong, or some of them have said that the one country, two system principle has been severely undermined. And recently I saw a letter writing to the South China Morning Post actually saying that with all these reforms, Hong Kong has become one country, one system. Being a person who knows the Chinese policies, how would you retort this accusation? <laughs> because many people simply do not understand what is meant by one country, two systems. And uh, as you, we, we can go back to, to the uh, <coughs> uh, statements by Mr. Deng Xiaoping back in the 1920s. Right. Uh, in accordance to Mr. Deng, there are two basic principles under one country, two systems. Mm -hmm. One is that Beijing will pledge to <coughs> support Hong Kong's original institutions 
a way of life. But there are many people who forget the other principle. Mm -hmm. That is, Hong Kong is to bear the responsibility uh, to prevent Hong Kong from becoming a base of subversion against uh, the mainland. And that Hong Kong to, uh, cannot be allowed to be used by other hostile forces, both internal and external, uh, to, 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 that, to flatten national security. Mm -hmm. So what Beijing is, is doing now is to make sure that the second principle is also uh, implemented. Mm -hmm. But since this principle cannot be implemented by Hong Kong alone, and some people are even challenging Beijing, uh, uh, threatening mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the nation's security, so what Beijing is, trying to, is doing now is to make sure that the original blueprint, okay. as made by Mr. Tan Xiaoping, is fully implemented in Hong Kong to ensure the one country, two system is correctly implemented. Right. So and that's why one country, two system can be carried beyond uh, 2047. So obviously there is a mismatch in understanding of what the central government has wanted one country, two system for but Hong Kong that's compared to what the opposition well, I mean, or the, the West are thinking. The opposition simply try to, to convince people in Hong Kong as well as elsewhere mm -hmm. that one country, two system means that Hong Kong is an independent political entity. Okay. There's no responsibility to save national security. Right. Professor, you know, in, the, in, the, in the last couple of months, we saw that a lot of organizations from the Hong Kong Professional Teachers Union, the Civil Human Rights Front, and the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movement of China, all that organization either have been disbanded or the leaders being uh, arrested under the national security law. Do you think all the relevant organizations have been dealt with already or do you expect there are more to come? No, I don't think all the organizations have been uh, dealt with. Um, basically, those more prominent ones have been dealt with. Right. But I will admit that there's still there are a lot of people in Hong Kong still have uh, anti-China, anti-communist sentiments. Mm -hmm. And it will take a long time before Hong Kong can really uh, <coughs> satisfy the one country, two systems principles. Okay, okay. Professor, previously many people do have not taken the issue of foreign intervention seriously. A lot of people say there's no, pro there's no intervention whatsoever, there's nothing in play. Do you think people are, are now more convinced that there is a foreign hand in Hong Kong matters? Well, when you look back at the last 10 years in Hong Kong, and when we look, look at all those uh, large-scale and small-scale protests and the riots, it is hard to believe that there's no foreign intervention is, is involved. Okay. Now, if you are talking about ad hoc protests, which are short-lived, and then small-scale, then you may say that the, these activities are spontaneous, spontaneous in nature. Okay. But we are, we, when we are talking about large-scale, sustained and uh, well-financed kind of uh, riots and turmoil, if not, if not for the involvement of foreign forces, how can you expect this turmoil to be sustained for such a long time? Mm -hmm. um, let's move on to another matter that I'm sure the viewers are interested. A lot of responses with all this change in the political and, and, and legal structure, a lot of Hong Kongers have commented that there's no point in voting anymore. For example, in the upcoming um, ele election committee uh, in next, next, next coming Sunday, um, if you look at the number of, a lot of sectors are uncontested. Look at the number of voters are actually fewer because they're all institutionally based. So people feel that there's no relevance of the, of the election to us, to the most people. So how would you convince the people of Hong Kong to embrace this system is good for Hong Kong, in well, short. People have to think about uh, this very simple idea. That is, our electoral reforms is not for the sake of ele elections, it's not particularly not for the sake of widening the electoral basis of mm -hmm. Hong Kong's elections, but for the sake of restoring order in Hong Kong and to make sure that uh, the patriots are running Hong Kong. So the new foundation will be established in the future for <coughs> the electoral system mm -hmm. to be widened and broadened mm -hmm. to bring into the scene more people. Okay. You know, so if we use the Western, Western ideas, Western values, Western, Western criteria to judge our electoral system, which we missed the important point. Okay. That is, our system is now for the sake of restoring order. All right. 
Professor, before we go to the break, I want to ask you from the international front. They, they of the Western politicians, politicians and media have said and criticised and condemned our authorities, saying that we have been high-handed and cracking down on our, our, our civil society. Also, they are saying that they're scaremongering our rule of law. And Hong Kong is built on the cornerstone of being rule of law as a financial hub. How do you answer those accusations? Well, when you, when you think about the fact that uh, and many of the projects and wires are sponsored and patronized by Western uh, powers and forces. And since they have failed in this attempt to subvert uh, China through Hong Kong, mm -hmm. of course, we expect them to be very unhappy about mm -hmm. what happened in Hong Kong. Right. But in any case, I, I think that uh, uh, what happened in Hong Kong in the last couple of years and Beijing's determination to restore under Hong Kong will make sure that uh, foreign forces in the future we are not there to, 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 to try to do anything to destabilize Hong Kong and okay. to use Hong Kong as a base of subversion right. against uh, the, uh, China. Right. So you are not, you're not worried about Hong Kong's financial hub status being affected by people saying that we don't have rule of law? I, I'm not worried about, uh, about it at all because a financial center requires stability. And uh, Hong Kong has its stability restored, and that means as a financial center, Hong Kong is even better uh, to, to serve uh, okay. different interests. Okay. Okay. Maybe we'll have a break and um, don't go away. Welcome back. We have been talking with Professor Lau, who is sharing with us his analysis of the current political and social developments in Hong Kong. Professor Lau, in the first half of the show, we discussed the, the background of what has happened in Hong Kong and both the local and international responses to the to changes. Now let's look at the objective of all these changes is we want Hong Kong to thrive. We want things to work again. Look at the government. Um, the, the, the government before has always said that they can't do the work properly because of the opposition filibustering and, and, and opposing the bills to, to go. Now, with the new system, it looks like we will, we will have more control on the government side. Do you think the government officials has the determination or the know-how to help Hong Kong to solve a long-time housing problem as well as your, the, the youth upward mobility issues and all that? What do you think? Well, it's easier for the government to govern these states now, because of support from Beijing, because of suppression of the opposition, because of better relationship between the legislature and the, and the government. But still, we think we need a government which is more proactive, which has a sense of crisis, right. uh, and uh, which has the determination to bring about policy changes and institutional reforms. And most importantly, which can mobilize the resources from society to support the government in its new endeavors. Mm -hmm. So do you think the pandemic still have a role to play? I mean, what are they trying to achieve? Because there have been talks that they may not participate in any more elections. What are they trying to achieve by not participating? I beg your pardon? I mean, I'm saying with the pandemic, do they still have a role to play? And if they are not participating in any of the elections, what can they do? Well, I think uh, from now on, we should not talk about uh, pandemics or other, other, or other forces. Well, when we're talking about the, the, the patriots running Hong Kong, we only differentiate, differentiate between patriots and non-patriots. Right. That is, whether you're pandemic or not, you can still okay. participate in Hong Kong politics. Now, most ideally, if they can transform themselves into part of the patriotic camp, in terms of that they advocate reforms, they advocate changes. Then I would say the future for these pandemics uh, will be very good as long as they can transform themselves into patriots. Right. So in other words, people are saying that the, the future of Hong Kong is going to be one-sided because it's one camp. So in your, in, in your words, actually, it's not true because even within the one-sided camp, the patriots, they can still act as what the pandemic said before. I mean, not filibustering, but of course, giving true opinions and or comments on government's um, actions. Well, 
the basic fact is all people running Hong Kong in the future will be preachers in, in one way or the other. That is, they support the central government and they will work within the constitutional order of Hong Kong. So if, if that's the case, then you may say that politically there will be not much differences between different kinds of politicians. Okay. But when we come to social issues, economic issues, issues concerning the, 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 the different generations, issues between genders, etc., I would say mm. that there are still a lot of uh, changes, okay. a lot of differences mm -hmm. uh, within the patriotic camp. Mm -hmm. Professor, on Friday, the district councillors had to swear a loyalty oath. Do you think that is good enough for us to find out who are the patriots and who are not? Well, I would say that the, 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 the vetting mechanism so far in place is already quite stringent mm -hmm. and uh, maybe a little bit too stringent. <laughs> so I, as, I can, as far as I can see, uh, in the first place, the vetting mechanism will play the role to make sure that all people joining the elections or joining the government will be patriots. But at the same time, for those people who don't want <laughs> to be <laughs> patriots, I don't think they will participate at all right. in, in the elections. Otherwise, they will be finding themselves in trouble right. because they will be vetted very stringently by the authorities. Mm -hmm. Professor Li Xiaobaolong, the director of Hong Kong and Macau's affairs office, pointing out that our future chief executive must have five major prerequisites. <laughs> let, yeah. let me read them out to the viewers. A firm political sense, they must be accountable, they have a love for the people, be able to unite and inspire, and a sense of commitment and responsibility. Do we have any individual or individuals within our current uh, um, politician now that will f fit the criteria, in well, your opinion? I would not place uh, the importance on single individual. But I, I must say that from Beijing point of view, it is looking for a whole group of people who together may be able to fulfill the criteria laid down by Beijing. Right. Because from, from, from our, our point of view, Hong Kong does not have yet the conditions to produce a leader which is, who is charismatic, who can command respect all in, all in the community. But if we can put our emphasis on the group as a whole, on the governing team, maybe we should be able to produce a better leadership right. for the government. Professor, I ever hear you properly, you said currently that you don't see any charismatic leader that might fulfill all the five prerequisites. Did if you I, say that? If I say there is such a person, I don't, you, may, you may disagree with me. Right. Yeah. No, if you say there is such a person, I'm going to say, who is that person? I'm sure that we all <laughs> want to know. Yeah. Right, anyway, mm. so let's move on to another issue that I'm sure people will be interested in, is a way forward. I mean, we have done all these. Hopefully, we have a, a good chief executive with his or her um, uh, um, um, major officials. But you know, patriotic values or identification to the mainland has never been our, our strength in Hong Kong. We have to say that the Western values, especially with the democratic values movement, is quite obvious. How can we do something about this in the years to come? Well, I would say that we should, we should start from uh, fulfilling the minimum requirement. That is, we should not do anything at all detrimental to the nation's interests. Now, that is the beginning. But gradually, I would say that people will develop a sense of uh, common fate with the nation. And that means we, we will share a lot of interests, uh, 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 a lot of values, even with the mainland. If that, if that happens, then we will have um, a bunch of more patriotic people in, in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And uh, initially, we want people to avoid doing anything against the country because that would be against their own interests. But eventually, when, 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 a, when a sense of sheer common fate happens, but particularly with the, all this uh, uh, suppression by the, by the West, I would expect that the Hong Kong people to be increasingly patriotic because they know it is the China, the, the nation, which is the, the ultimate guarantee for Hong Kong's interests and their own interests. Mm -hmm. And recently, you have, you have written, uh, you have written, written many articles that our nation's 14th five-year plan is really an opportunity for Hong Kong that we shouldn't miss. Can you elaborate on that? And when, what happens if we miss the boat again? Well, the problem is that uh, given the fact that the world is now in economic recession, and Hong Kong will not and cannot expect too much support 
or from from the West, or maybe even we expect sanction from them. And given the fact that China and Asia will still be the major point of growth in the world, and 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 the Chinese government is willing to help Hong Kong with different policies and and different facilities. If Hong Kong cannot see this opportunity again to use the policies by Beijing and opportunity from the mainland to upgrade our economy and on a better economic basis to solve our social problems, then Hong Kong may be in big trouble in, in the future. How big the trouble will be? Well, the, main, the, the biggest trouble is that we cannot retain our one country, two system. Okay. Because by, by then, Hong Kong will become a liability to, to the country and maybe even a source of trouble uh, for China. So, Professor, you have issued a very strong warning to, to Hong Kong that if we don't play with the mainland uh, directions, we, we can always have the possibility of losing our, our niche, which is one country, two systems. That's true. Well, because if Hong Kong uh, cannot economically serve the country, but becomes a source of political trouble, now, if we cannot maintain our stability, then all sorts of hostile forces can use Hong Kong against the, 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 the country. And if that is the case, why Beijing could still stick with one country, two systems? Right. Since you mentioned about our plans, I mean, last week there is a, a new, uh, I mean, new, the, the, the Qinghai plan coming out, which is in cooperation between Shenzhen and Hong Kong, which is exciting, I'm sure, I mean, I mean, I'm sure we've all heard about it. But given what has Hong Kong uh, us, um, usual practice, is that you hear about it, you talk about it, but nothing happens. Um, how can we en ensure uh, Hong Kong, especially our government officials, is going to take on the Qinghai plan seriously? Well. As I said before, we need a sense of crisis among our government people and in society. And of course, from, government, from a government point of view, it needs to show the Hong Kong people in a very concrete manner how Hong Kong can take advantage of Shanghai. In fact, Shanghai provides a mechanism to solve Hong Kong's land shortage for industrial development. If we cannot see this opportunity, <coughs> we will be in trouble. Now, the, the government has a role to, 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 to tell Hong Kong people in a very concrete manner how we can use all these opportunities and to maybe to set up some example as to how some people can succeed in using th these opportunities to, 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 to create a this sense of urgency among Hong Kong people and to also send, create a sense of optimism, a sense of hope among Hong Kong people that we still have a good future as long as we can seize the opportunities provided by uh, by, 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 by our country. Right. So thank you, Professor Lau, for your insights into Hong Kong's political and social development. We certainly look forward to a rejuvenated and more united Hong Kong. And thank you all for watching and have a good week and good night.